Good morning. My name is Belinda, and I'm recovering from codependency. So I'm bringing you the eight principles. So if you have your um, little brochure here, open up to the, this page right here. It says eight principles. So our eight principles are derived from Matthew um, chapter 5. Sorry, I can't see here, but chapter 5 from 3 to 10. And each principle walks you through your, your journey to recovery from letting you go of where you are and find, finding your true self in Jesus. It also reminds us that we don't walk alone. This is read every week and helps us remember who we are in Christ and how, we, how Jesus has instructed us to walk. So it's important for us to reflect on this and, uh, and actually follow where, we, where, where we're going. Can we say a thank you to Belinda? We're recovering mycoholics. We don't know how to turn the mic off. Okay, my name's Adina. Hi, Adina. So you can respond back. Hi, Adina. You're. Oh, that was awesome. And I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who's overcome codependency. Oh, Belinda. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to make a joke out of that, but I don't know what to say. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, so I'm a recovering, um, I mean, yeah, see, now I'm a recovering mycoholic too, but anyway, I've recovered from codependency, but I'm also walking through fear of man and anxiety. How many of you would say that you're walking through stuff too? You have some baggage. Oh man, that's awesome. You know why it's awesome though? Is because God actually wants to work through that stuff, okay? And the reason we introduce ourselves that way is because what ends up happening is you start to identify with that person and understand that we can be vulnerable with each other. And when we're vulnerable, we're authentic. Would you agree? Yes. And that's how we can walk in the fullness of who we are and who God's created us to be. So as you notice, I have this big water jug here and I gotta give a shout out to my friend, Rick. Rick, can you just wave your hand? Rick has been such a friend to me in Celebrate Recovery. And I always forget my water, always forget my water, and I always have dry mouth. So one Wednesday night, Rick comes to me and gives me bubbly. Bless his heart. I made a really good like, comeback of like, funniness by drinking the bubbly, and I had to keep removing the mic because I kept burping into the mic. Okay, so I don't want that happening again, and I have all my water I need. So up on the top there, Belinda had, had read the principles. So you have it on your brochure. And what Celebrate Recovery does is each week we have a lesson and then we have a testimony, lesson, testimony. And during the lesson time, we go through one of those eight principles. And the reason we do is because it creates a pathway to recovery. Is this making sense? So I don't want you to feel like, wow, that's a very structured and weird way of doing church. It's actually really good because then I can understand how I'm making progress, right? If we're hitting these markers along the way, then okay, we got this. Okay, I'm learning this. And then what ends up happening through our, our vulnerability and through our ability to share authentically about our recovery, we can be like, oh, Ariel, right there, you're, you're working on this. This is the step you can take to get there. This is what's helped me. So when I was doing this lesson, the Lord had told me that he wanted me to start at square one, ground zero. Are you guys ready for this? And I'm doing this because I want us to understand that it's not, like Celebrate Recovery isn't just for people who have drug and alcohol addiction, because many of us will go there in our head. It's actually for many more things, and I'm going to list those things, but many of us walk through denial, which is step one in this lesson. So are you guys ready? So you have on your sheet, you have on the right-hand side the lesson of denial, and there's fill in the blanks, and there's really cheesy acronyms that I know that John L Roderman just loves, <laughs> but I promise we'll make it fun, but I also want us to have open hearts in it. Can you guys have open hearts? I think of the story, the many stories in scripture where Jesus talks about him being the good shepherd, David being the shepherd, and I was reminded during worship that 
we like to think of it as the prodigal son, that so-and-so is coming home. You know, the, the story of how Jesus leaves the 99 and goes for the one, the prodigal, right? But the reality is, is each and every one of us are the prodigal in different areas of our life that Jesus wants to meet us and be the good shepherd in. So with Celebrate Recovery, I brought it here two years ago. And I did because when I was going through my own stuff as a teenager, I ran to the church, but I didn't share much with the church because I thought that everybody within the church had it all together, which is far from the truth. <laughs> but it's like we need to create a platform for people to understand that because many people think, oh, I'm going to be struck down with lightning if I enter the church. But the reality is if our hearts are soft, if we understand that God is our good shepherd, then we're sharing authentically with other people that others are invited into that safe place too. So principle one says, I realize I'm not God. I admit that I am powerless. Can you guys say, I am powerless? I am powerless. To control my tendency to do the wrong thing and that my life is unmanageable. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is really powerful. Jesus stood in some of his first words, the greatest sermon that he ever preached, we know as the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you who hunger and thirst for righteousness. And many of us have gone through stuff and it's like, God, I want, I want your will in this situation. I want you to move and act. He's also saying here, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And there's this author, maybe some of you have heard of him, his name is Peter Scazzaro, and I kind of brutalized his last name, but he has written books about emotionally healthy spirituality, emotionally healthy discipleship. And he says something along these lines, and I've added to it. We live in a tension between two worlds. The reality that we live in a broken world and we can respond in a broken way. And the second realm is the kingdom of God where there's God's glory bringing healing and wholeness and freedom to those areas of woundedness. When we engage both of those worlds, we enter into the suffering of Jesus who hung on a cross between heaven and earth. The pain and the struggles that we face is an opportunity to bring that tension before Jesus and face all the reasons why he died on the cross for us. How beautiful is that Celebrate Recovery? And our church hangs on that tension in a very healthy way. Would you agree? And I love that we can enter into this church body and say, you know what, this is who I am. And I want God, I want that tension. I want to feel why you died on the cross for me. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And this goes along step one, which says, we admitted we are powerless over how our addictions and compulsive behaviors and that our lives have become unmanageable. And why are we doing principle and step together? Well, one is the how and one is the why we receive recovery. So we do those two together. The steps will look very similar to AA, CA, whatever anonymous meaning. The principles are all based out of the Beatitudes. And here, the scripture that goes with step one is, I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, in my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, this becomes like a precipice in terms of the next set of scriptures in Romans, because the next set of scriptures in Romans talks about how we're living according to the Spirit, but we can't live according to the Spirit unless we empty our fleshly desires out to the Spirit, right? Right? It's, it's that two open hands that Jesus, I want you, I want you to give, I want to give you this baggage and I want you to work through me in that. So think about this, before we can take the first step of recovery, we must first face and admit our denial. God tells us, now you can't heal a wound by saying it's not there. Can we just hold our hearts this morning? Uh, Josh and Lennon have been taking us on a journey of oneness in Christ, taking us on a journey of moving from, from chair two to chair one, kingdom living. So I'm praying right now that the Holy Spirit touches our hearts, softens and massages those areas that maybe we have been in denial, that we aren't walking in oneness with you. So I ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring us to those places that you want to heal and help us 
know the depth of the love that you have for us because this is truly who we are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you have a pen, you have those fill in the blanks, there's gonna be the acronym coming up here. So if, this will give you a few minutes to find a pen or to find someone who does have a pen. At the bottom of that handout on the right-hand side, there's the big question that we're gonna answer at the end. What areas of our life are we beginning to face the truth and step out of denial? So I have been on my own inner healing journey. I hope each one of you are open to your own inner healing journey. But part of my journey and my understanding, and I know that it is the truth, is that many of us protect those inner parts of us because of childhood things how we grew up as a child, how we responded to situations and scenarios. So let's just say that we're in denial because we're protecting something from our inner child or our young adulthood. Can you guys all do that? So the good news is, is that God loves all of those parts and he wants all of those parts. When you think of denial, maybe some of these messages can resonate with you. Maybe you've said some of these things. A denial statement can sound like, can we stop talking about it? Talking only makes it worse. If we don't talk about it, it'll go away. Let's pretend it didn't happen. Well, he really doesn't drink that much. Okay, I have like really small print on here, try to see the whole thing, so that is why I'm really zooming in here. Um, another one could be, Paul drinks more than I do. Suzanne has more partners than I did. Johnny's been married three times. I've only been married twice. I scream because you make me so mad. If you didn't nag me so much, I wouldn't. I need a few drinks to relax. Okay, so denial addresses our hurts, habits, and hangups. So at Celebrate Recovery, we don't say, hey, I'm here, I'm, an, I'm a Dina, I'm an alcoholic. We don't say that, we say we're a grateful believer in Jesus Christ because that is our identity first, but then we also identify with certain hurts, habits, and hang-ups. So what is a hurt, habit, and a hang-up? A hurt is a physical or emotional pain that is caused by you or another person, even a situation. So examples of this would be abuse, abandonment, divorce, relationship issues, maybe dysfunctional family. A habit would be a repetitive and reoccurring pattern of coping that is used to numb pain. Examples of this is addiction to drugs, alcohol, pornography, abusive behavior, workaholism. And a hang-up would be a negative mental attitude that's used to cope with people or something such as anger, fear, depression, people-pleasing, unforgiveness. I had double fear in there. I wonder if that's like Holy Spirit saying, you really need to look at this guy. <laughs> But usually it's actually an Adina typo, but that's okay. I'm not denying it. Okay, so denial from hurts, habits, and hangups causes the following issues if they're not dealt with. So here's where you can fill in the blank. Denial disables our feelings. We lose energy, so energy lost. Negates growth. Isolates us from God. Alienates us from our relationships. And it lengthens the pain. And if you didn't get all that, I will... Slide by slide, it'll also have it on there for you. So the first one, denial disables our feelings. They promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves to destructive habits. For a man is a slave to anything that has conquered him. The interesting thing about disabling is our, our feelings is it's actually ironic because me, I will admit that I'm a very busy person, and I was telling my husband, man, I'm watching this person, and they just zoom, 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 it causes me anxiety. He's like, Adina, you do the same thing. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to look at why I'm so busy like that, okay? Because busyness for me pushes everything down. I don't have time to think about things. How many of you can be busy? Busy, 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 right? Okay, we're talking about denial. Do you guys wanna raise your hands a little bit higher? How many of you can struggle with busyness? Okay, good. Wow, okay, we're engaging this really well. So, they promise them freedom while they themselves are slaves to destructive habits. A man is a slave to anything that has conquered him. Okay, Adina needs to look in at the busyness. We need to look 
okay, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me about why I am so actively busy? What is actually underneath this? Because it's controlling my life. Busyness controls my life. Various ways of coping. So not only busyness, but here's a list of other ways, okay? Control, anger, performance. Perhaps I'm very critical or judgmental to myself and other people. Over-spiritualize. I just want to pause there for a second. Over-spiritualizing a situation can look like just pray about it. God will deal with it. And then not actually diving deep as to why those things are happening. Uh, Over-spiritualizing actually can, the fruit of that is actually judgmental. Because people won't actually want to talk to us if we are breezing over a very difficult situation and giving them cliche Christian answers. Does that make sense? Okay. Self-sabotaging, perhaps I push people away before they can actually hurt me. Or maybe I'm doing so good for a period of time and then I slip back because I'm so used, I'm so used to destructive habits. Being passive, alcohol and drugs, food, pornography, codependency. Codependency would be I get so entrenched in relationships that I don't know where the other person stops and I begin. Does that sound okay? Get that? Uh, love and relationships, perhaps I don't know how to be single. Perhaps I'm constantly seeking relationships. Isolating or overspending or spending too much. And so some of these things might be very uncomfortable to admit, so I want you to, to know that is not me pointing fingers. I'm just actually bringing the playing ground quite level. This is just, this is who we are sometimes. Various ways of coping. But here's the thing, is all of these things, plus more, Christ wants in those. Faith, this is why he died on the cross, is so he can enter these things so that we don't have to be these things. Okay, I'm going to show you a little bit of a, a little picture. And now when I'm, when I'm showing you this picture, I'm not putting you in a box. And I don't want anybody putting each other in a box. But I just want you to look at how do I identify maybe with some of these unhealthy habits or these unhealthy, unhealthy traits. Unhealthy traits. Okay. So these are called family roles. Do you guys like the visual? So these are ways in which you can potentially use those coping mechanisms in our family system, okay? So... In the, in the middle, I mean, on the left-hand side, you got the addict. He's named the addict, okay? The addict isn't just for drugs and alcohol. Let's just say some, some of our families struggle with anger or perhaps overspending. You fill in the blank, the unhealthy coping mechanism. This was just the nicest picture I could find, okay? So all of these individuals here operate around this unhealthy person. So how are they coping with what's happening? First, you have the caretaker. He shields the people from the consequences of their actions. They will sacrifice themselves so that other members don't feel the pain. They keep everyone happy. They make sure everyone is okay. The hero, they're similar to the caretaker. They will maintain appearances. They do whatever to restore the dysfunction in the home. They are only they are overly responsible, self-sufficient, and even a perfectionist. They inwardly struggle maintaining their own expectations. The scapegoat. They're actually the opposite of the hero, if you can't tell by the picture. They act out hostility or provoke negative attention to themselves to distract from the dysfunction in their own home. They divert the family's attention from where it should be. The mascot. They are the humor humorous ones in the family. They try to be silly and to lighten up other people. They can become anxious or depressed because they are constantly in motion. Their happiness is actually a protective mask. The lost child. They are the quiet individuals who fly under the radar while the other family members play their own adoptive role in dealing with these issues. They avoid everything and everyone. They want to disappear. How does that feel? I can feel like a pin drop. I can hear like a pin drop. It's because many of us identify with those uncomfortable things, right? And I know for myself, when, when I'm in an area where I feel vulnerable, 
oh, well, is, is this person speaking to me? I just want us to just, you know what, open up those shields that sometimes I feel like a horse, right, when those things get pointed out. You know those shielders on a horse? I'm like, nobody look at me. <laughs> I'm super uncomfortable. Okay. But the reality is, is we're here in a church body where everybody is walking through stuff. Okay. So what is it that you are identifying with? What parts of those resonate with you? The beautiful thing is that when we name it and when we have open baggage, who deals with it? It's the Lord that deals with it, right? So let's open that up. This Lord, how do you want to deal with this? And now it's important, important for us to understand we've taken on these roles because they have functioned for us for a while. They've helped us move through things for a while but Jesus wants him to move through things, not just for a while, but forever. And the beauty of that is, is when we come into relationship with other people, then I can be like, you know what, this is what I'm walking through. They therefore share. And the beauty of that is that creates a testimony for God's glory in that. We have to identify it, then God's going to use it to bring out his glor glory in all of that. How many of you want to be able to share with your family what God is doing in your life? How many of you want to share with your neighbors what God is doing in your life? So the next part of the denial is, disab oh, that's denial, D, disabling our feelings. These are ways that we disable our feelings, but the next one is E, energy lost. It says, he frees the prisoners, he lifts the burdens from those bent beneath their loads. With denial of those wounded areas, we lose energy, which is really ironic because we're doing the very thing we want to do to cover up those areas, which actually takes more energy than letting the Lord deal with them. You th my busyness is very draining, right? Other things are very draining, like being critical of other people is very draining. It hurts the head, right? So. Again, Lord, deal with these issues. I don't want to be drained with energy. I want you to lift the burden from me. I want you to lift my head. What a beautiful image is that we are imprisoned to those things, but God doesn't want us to be imprisoned to those things. He wants to be your energy. He wants to open the, the jail cell for you to walk out and to walk freely. Oftentimes when we actually look at addressing these things, though, it is very overwhelming because it is highly vulnerable. It's like the heat's being turned up. And, and remember when Josh talked about the crucible of suffering? Because that's exactly what's happening, is these things are getting brought to the surface, but we are getting purified in the middle of that. We want to transfer the energy required to maintain our denial into learning God's truth, not just at Celebrate Recovery, but in our faith journey. This is, this is for everybody. We want to maintain our denial but yet we, we need to replace it by learning God's truth and a healthy love for others and an openness to God's love for us. The N of denial stands for negates growth. So denial disables our feelings, we lose energy, and it negates our growth. They cried to the Lord in their troubles and he rescued them. He led me from the darkness and shadow of death and snapped their chains. In the recovery world, there's a little saying that goes like this, you are as sick as your secrets. So I want us to be reminded that Jesus wants us to be, have his way in our lives so that he can be the savior in everything. Jesus wants to be the savior in everything. When we're aligned with God's will in all parts of our life, we are growing, we're experiencing him, you know, Peter Skazar, Kazar, whatever his last name is, okay, this guy. But he's talking about this, um, this chain we go through in our own growth. So we move, we know the words to say, we know what to do at church, we start serving at church, but then we end, we end up hitting this wall that we have a choice to, make, to stop our spiritual growth here. And if we actually move through the wall, which is any of those hurts, habits, and hang-ups, then our faith has the opportunity to grow and to deepen. And who doesn't, that's what contagious faith is, is when people see you shining God's glory and how do we get more of God's glory in our life? 
is digging in those valleys into where he is and the healing that he wants to bring through those things. So he's saying, they cried out to the Lord in their troubles and he rescued them. What a way to activate our faith is knowing God's truth despite what we are walking through. He led them from their darkness and the shadow of death and he snapped their chains. You know what, even though I'm going through this, even though maybe I'm busy, the truth is I don't need to be busy. I need to rest in him, which has also been a constant message here lately. Okay, God, looking within, how do I actually rest in you? So we're taking these messages, we're taking the sources of coping, and we're looking at them, and we're moving our faith through those. And the interesting thing about faith, too, and in this circle that I'm talking about, is faith can be just intellectual. And we don't want our faith to be just intellectual. It's like this image where our head gets plugged into our heart, right? That the connection is actually our faith is both. And that's how we also move forward. I stands for isolates us from God. Denial also isolates us from God. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim we have fellowship with him yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of his son, his Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. 1 John 1, 5 to 7. Perhaps some of us can get overwhelmed by situations and be like, well, we kind of like disassociate where we shut down our faith and we just kind of isolate. Maybe does that resonate with some people? Just, I'm going to just walk away. God, I don't know where you are right now. I can't feel you. I can't experience you. I read your truth, but it's not connecting. It's because denial isolates us from God. It isolates that head-heart connection. And when we are facing these things, oneness with him starts to happen. We start coming into his light, and we're ready to give him everything. We invite him to light up all of those areas of darkness. We invite him to provide truth. So instead of turning away and saying, God, I don't know where you are, the prayer could be, God, I know you're here. This is what I am struggling with. This is how I am coping. And then we invite him to provide the truth to us. A, denial also alienates us from relationships. Stop lying to each other, tell the truth, for we, all, we are all parts of each other, and when we lie to each other, we're hurting ourselves. Ephesians 4.25. Denial tells us we're getting away with our isolation. If we're having a hard time connecting with other people, ask the Lord why. What is it about me? that is causing me to have a hard time connecting with other people. The thing about isolation, the irony maybe, is we think nobody knows what's happening with us when we're isolated. <laughs> that was a joke, but it's also tr truthful. We think nobody knows why we're hiding or what's actually going on with us, but we do. We just don't know what to say and how to say it to you. Those areas of isolating can be rooted from inner childhood. Maybe you're, maybe you're protecting yourself from relationships for a reason. We're, we need to live openly with Jesus, and as we do, we will bear fruit. We will bear patience, forgiveness, joy, kindness, love, but we have to open ourselves up for that. And as we open ourselves up to relationships with other people, then we become more connected. We are the body of Christ, and how does the body move when all the parts are connected, right? So when we open ourselves up, we face the denial, we're authentic before each other, then those parts start to move. And this part here is alienates us from our relationships. One of the key words there is us. I know when I was in denial that I would be, so-and-so did this, and so-and-so's doing this to hurt me, when it's really, okay, why am I getting so offended? Why do I have the inability to forgive this person? What is actually going on in here? 
When we step out of denial, we're drawn into a community. The beautiful thing about Celebrate Recovery is we have gender-based groups on specific issues and we share authentically on the questions that are on your handout there. And what I have seen is people who have come to the community keep coming because they're, they're wondering why, like, where can I get this type of authentic relationship? And that's an opportunity that all of us have in this church, in our family, in our communities, but we have to first be carriers ourselves and know what that looks like. L, the last one, is it lengthens our pain. God's promise says, I will give you back your health again and I will heal your wounds, Jeremiah 30, 17. The longer some of us keep saying, you're making me so angry, or I can't handle this anymore, the longer we actually stay in the issue. Okay, I just need the next slide up there. Um, in reality, denial allows us to hold on to that pain and to allow that, um, I think of like, I'm trying to think of the actual word, but I think of boo-boo, okay? The, I, what is the actual word of a, a wound, but a boo-boo? Let's just say a boo-boo, okay? To keep it funny. But when that boo-boo happens, what do we do? We want to cover it up. We want to give it kisses, right? And so it happens. Denial happens. These things are unearthed in us that the Lord wants to cover up. The Lord wants to give us kisses for that. And he doesn't, wanna, he doesn't want that pain or that boo-boo to stay there forever. But the longer we, we say that we don't want anything to do with it or we don't want to touch it, we don't want to go there, the longer our pain is actually lengthened. But facing it is good. Facing it is hard. But facing it is good. I will give back your health again, and I will heal your wounds. We are going to take a few moments here to practice a Celebrate Recovery style small group. How are you guys feeling about this? My daughter goes, good, not so good, and meh. How are we feeling about it? Good? Okay. So in your pew, I want you to grab one or two other people, and I am going to give you two minutes to share on the question that is there, okay? So the question on your handout is, um, what areas of your life are you beginning to face the truth and step out of denial? So I will give you the cue, and we're gonna, we still have a couple more things after to do, but I'll give you a cue when we're all, when we're all ended. All right, I am going to cue up our crew at the back here, we're gonna show a little bit of a testimonial video with Celebrate Recovery. As We'll pull it up as you guys are winding down here. You got about 15 seconds. I came to Celebrate Recovery for addiction problems and to work on my trust issues. I've made progress in the way of learning that I don't have to walk this walk alone and to lean more on Christ rather than my own understanding. I would encourage anyone that's feeling out of place within themselves to just show up and if you're a newcomer and have already attended, just keep coming back. Hi, my name's John. I'm a grateful believer in God. Um, I attend CR because I struggled with addiction in the past. Uh, that I can't do it alone, that life is not meant to be alone in relationships need time to grow with people. I had to just stick with it even though it's scary. Life is scary, but it's easier with people. Hi, I'm Aaron and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ. And I struggle with fear, anxiety, and uh, anger. What brought me to CR was actually just a simple invitation Sunday after Sunday. My uh, relationship with my kids and staying calm has also gotten better. Thinking about coming to CR, I would encourage you just to come check it out. Um, the people there are very easy to get along with, non-judgmental, and it will help you with any problem you have. Goodbye. <laughs> I've realized my hurts, hang-ups, and habits, and I've worked through trust issues, 
and I'm currently working on anger and self-discipline. What encouragement would you give to someone who wants to check Celebrate Recovery out? Um, come, be prepared to be greeted by positive people, and just know that God loves you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Belinda, and I'm a deep, grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I am overcoming um, codependency. Even though I've been doing inner healing, that I am, I have other pieces of me that needed to be healed, that I needed to go a little bit deeper, that even though they were brought to the surface, that I needed to heal those pieces so that I could be more of who I am and, uh, and start putting boundaries into place and, um, you know, say no to people and, uh, and just be true to who I am and what God wants me to do. Regardless of where you are in your walk of life, just come and discover what, who you are, what you can do and what you can overcome. And I'm hoping to see you there and we'll talk to you later. Hi, my name is Diana. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who has overcome anxiety and depression. Uh, what brought me to Celebrate Recovery is me trying to people please and fix other people and their addiction issues. Taking a look within myself, it's not about what other people need to fix, it's about what I need to fix and putting Christ in the center of my life. Uh, the encouragement I give to someone is I really believe that um, it's a great community, it's uh, wonderful and there's so much growth that all of us can do. Say it again. Which one? The whole thing? Working on people pleasing. Oh. <laughs> Is this a test? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> and working on people pleasing. Yeah. Suffers from memory loss. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sounds about right. From remembering why I'm here. Why am I here? <laughs>